The first thing I want to ask you is, what if I told you that the biggest technological changes that everybody's talking about in Silicon Valley are actually happening here on a larger, larger scale? My name is Marco Gervasi and I'm the author of East Commerce. My book tells the story of how China has created a new technological model that is actually coming out of its borders and it's inspiring developing and developed countries. This is quite a change for China, and what I want to share with you today is some of the findings that I had during my journey. So, I've been living in China for over 11 years, and uh, my business, my job has been to help foreign businesses establish their operations here in a very traditional way. Big investments, millions of dollars, There's a, this is a semiconductor factory in the back, and uh, very typical um, expensive um, assets. So. It was business as usual until three years ago when I realized that something was changing. Technology was changing the China that I knew in a way that I really did not understand. I come from art, not from science, I'm a lawyer, and uh, back then I didn't know anything about technology and I barely knew how to use my mobile phone. So I thought it was time for a mental upgrade, like to upgrade my mental operating system. So I decided to go somewhere. Actually, I, I bumped into this place. While I was in a cafe in Milan, a friend of mine told me about a place called Singularity University, based in Mountain View, California, and invested by Google, NASA, and Genentech. Singularity University is a place where they teach you what technology does to our society and how technology is going to change the world in the next 25 years. They pick nine technologies, those who believe are going to impact at least one billion people. I was extremely fascinated by what I was learning. Well, first of all, I enrolled in one of the executive courses, and I was extremely fascinated by what I was learning. And after I came back, I started a blog. Every day I would pick a topic on tech-related subjects, 140 words. I would, sorry, I would pick a topic and then summarize it in 140 words and send it out to a growing mailing list. Soon I found myself focusing more and more on China until something happened that really opened my eyes. On 11 November 2013, I mean this now sounds like history, uh, but on 11 November 2013, in just 24 hours, Alibaba sold 5.8 billion US dollars of goods. This is double the amount of Cyber Monday which was then the biggest e-commerce sale event in the world. I was shocked. I mean, I could not believe what was happening, and I knew that something big was really happening. So I did something completely crazy with my life. I put my business on hold. I gave up my office, my house, my income. I crashed on a friend's sofa, bought myself a bicycle, and I started a research journey that I thought, I thought would last only three months, but actually lasted 15 months. And I started to interview as many people as possible. I ended up interviewing more than 200 people, and some among them, there were the CEOs, VPs and C-levels of some of Asia's biggest technology companies. And I did not stop to China. I actually traveled across four continents because I realized that what was really happening is that China had created a system that was actually coming out and was actually being used or inspired several other countries. Countries like Indonesia, countries like Nigeria, countries like Brazil or India were actually looking at China as a way, as a source of inspiration. Some companies in Indonesia were calling themselves not anymore we are the eBay of Indonesia, but they were saying we are the Taobao of Indonesia. And I was really, really impressed that people even knew what Taobao was in Indonesia. And um, I decided that there was a, a story worth chasing, and then I decided to write a book. And I knew that there wasn't a way to describe this phenomenon, so I tried to find a word to name it, and I decided to call it East Commerce. And that's how my book was born. And just a few numbers to explain you what we're talking about here. So there are around 3 billion internet users in the world. Around 25% of these users are based in China and counting. 
667. In the U.S., only 279 only. And China has over 361 million web shoppers, and they plan that in the next two or three years we will get to 500 million. In the U.S., it's below 200 million. It's 192, 193. The e-commerce um, uh, demand for this year is 566 billion, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you really understood, you really understand how big this phenomenon is. So among the many people that I met along the way, there's one girl that really impressed me the most for what she has done with her life in such a short amount of time. Her name is Fan Fan, and she comes from Ling'an, which is a city just outside Hangzhou, on the other side of the Shanghai Bay area. And Fan Fan comes from a, a very modest family, and um, she studied fashion at university in Hangzhou and then worked as a model. She doesn't speak English. She's never been overseas. She didn't pursue an MBA, nor has fancy friends. But she has a great, great passion, and her passion is fashion design. One day back in 2003, her roommate, while they were at university, um, told her about something called Taobao. And um, Fan Fan didn't know what Taobao was, but her roommate told her that Taobao was a new way for people to buy and sell goods online, any kind of goods. So Fan Fan was actually curious about this Taobao, and she decided that she wanted to open a shop. She would not use it for several years, but at least the shop was there. She moved on and worked as a model for a few years, and then after a while she decided that she wanted to do something more with her life. She needed a new challenge. So she remembered that she opened this shop on Taobao, this was six years later, and she thought and she realized, first of all, that Taobao was now becoming huge and that more and more people were buying online. So, so she decided to make a little experiment. One day she went to downtown Hangzhou to the textile market and she decided to buy some of the dresses that she thought girls would like to buy. She then asked to a photographer friend to help her assemble a photo shoot. She picked the location, she modeled four dresses herself, and she put everything online. And she waited. In few days, all the dresses were sold. So she decided to go back to the market. Again, and again, and again. Until she realized that she needed to find a different way to sell. Because she couldn't cope with the demand. There was just too much demand for what she could offer. She basically bought all, most of the dresses that were sold in the market. So she asked herself, what shall I do next? Fun Fun realized that young Chinese girls like designer clothes, but they are too expensive and sometimes they are not tailored to the local taste. So she thought about, what shall I do? How could I do that? Well. I know how to draw this. She, it, after all, she went to fashion school and she was a model, so I know how to market this. And she knew that she could launch a brand, but actually launching a brand is not a walk in the park. You have to put up a lot of capital, and this is the, very, the first very important thing. And she didn't have capital. And Fan Fan knew that she was a model and she was a designer. But she's not a business, she was not a businesswoman, and most of all, she was not sure she could pull this off on her own. So she thought and thought and asked herself the typical question that every entrepreneur asks herself or himself. If I had limited resources, how would I use them? She knew that if she used the traditional way of launching a brand, like going into production, distribution, and point of sales, that would be unfeasible for her. It would simply be too expensive. So she started to think about alternative ways. And she realized that actually she was living in the biggest textile cluster of the world, the Hangzhou area. She didn't need to go into production. People were already producing. She just needed to find the right producer for her. So where she needed to focus was designing on one side, and marketing on the other side. And this is what she did. She found an office in the outskirts of Anjou industrial area. She converted it into a showroom where she would design and she would create the prototypes and then assemble the photo shootings. Everything else was done by the distributors, sorry, by the producers. And so she launched her brand, Green Lip. For three months, 90 days, 
She worked from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. of the following day, 21 hours. She was working, sleeping, and eating in the same room. Her bed was actually next to her table. She would send a girl out twice a day to buy her food. That's all. She soon became, she soon started to lose weight. She became sleep deprived and she nearly had a nervous breakdown. Had she known that launching an online business in China would be so tough, she would have never ever done it. Yet victory was near. Her site started to have traction so after a while, she opened another Taobao shop, and then a Timo store. She actually moved uh, a little bit up, higher the value chain. And then another Timo store, two Taobao shops, two Timo store, a total of four stores. Soon, she started to make millions. And at the end of 2013, she, her brand, Greenlip, made 13 million US dollars. That's Fun Fun House in the outskirts of Hangzhou. She was becoming very rich. So, if we stopped here, my talk would end something like this. If you are motivated, if you are resourceful, resourceful, passionate, and you want to try to, all, to change old things and old ways of doing things using new ways, and you are a hardworking person, Internet and e-commerce in China allow you infinite possibilities. Anyone can become like Fun Fun. Unfortunately, nowadays, everybody is thinking about launching an online business. Fun Fun realized that since 2009, when she joined Taobao, more and more people were buying online. And the, her competitors realized what made her business tick, why she was so good, and started to copy her. Soon. Green leaf copycats started to appear on Taobao and Tmall. Her revenues were going down and traffic was going down. What shall I do? What can I do? Everything she was doing, competitors were catching up. So she came up with another ingenious idea. Fun Fun realized that even though women are pregnant, they still want to look sexy, right? And she realized that there was nothing edgy out there for pregnant women. So she went back to the drawing board and studied which materials had the flexibility to allow her to design a collection that would last throughout the pregnancy, could be put away and used again. So she launched the first design edgy pregnant women collection. And it was a blast. It opened a blue ocean for her that put distance between her and her competitors. It was extremely successful. Now, how long will Fun Fun success last? How long she will be able to keep her competitors at bay? That is something that I'm not very sure. But something that I was very sure was that after hearing Fun Fun's story, I was extremely confused. I have worked so many years helping foreign companies negotiate the best, as I would say to my customers, deals with local producers. I've seen how the local producers, what, the, what kind of efforts they had to put behind launching a business, investing in buying land, finding uh, staff, retaining, training staff, retaining staff. I mean, it was a huge, huge investment. How could a girl so young with such a limited amount of capital be able to set up such an incredible business and be so successful in just a few years? I mean, I felt like everything that I learned in the last 11 years went just down the drain. Instead of making me feel better, my research made me feel even more confused. I felt I was becoming a dinosaur. I was looking at a new world that I, could, that I was struggling to understand. And then it hit me. Fun Fun had not invented anything in particular. She was simply using what was already there. And thanks to technology, she was rearranging it in a completely new way. Fun Fun had put her in, a, in such a sweet spot between producers on one side and distributors on the other side. And what she had done was to make the process much more efficient. That was her own innovation. Fun Fun showed me that technology in China has not only changed the life of the people, it has allowed them to launch with a limited amount of capital, 
business that have immense potential. Technology in China has changed the rules of the game. You see, in China, development used to be, as I call it, top-down. It was planned by the central government and driven by joint venture, multinationals, or state-owned enterprises. But now, thanks to technology, individuals, not companies, can change and reform entire sector sectors, just like the fashion industry, just like what Fun Fun did. It's a bottom-up growth. So the good news is that the paradigm has moved from power to the people to power to the individuals. The bad news is that the very same technology that is allowing individuals to change the economy is creating a fierce and merciless competition. Today, launching online business in China is one of the toughest and most brutal fatigue I've ever, ever seen. So, in trying to make sense of everything that I learned along this book, I kind of trying to read between the lines of the interviews, the people that I met and everything that I learned. And I understood that there's one thing that is constant, and is that technology seems to have in China a very precise role. When you look at companies like Alibaba and you ask yourself, how can they become so big? How can they eclipse their competitors? How can they make so much money and yet receive help from the government? Well, the answer is that technology for them is not another way to make money. It's a new model for growth. They are using technology to reform sectors. They are using technology to create a new type of infrastructures. So when you think about, so I was trying to understand all these CEOs that I met, this, I call it this 1%. What do they have in common? How did they do it if the competition is so tough? Well, one of the answers might be that they have found a way to align their startup to the way to grow the Chinese economy and drive reforms. Let me give you an example. I don't know how many of you know Yi Haodian, number one store. It's now China's biggest grocery online store. The two founders were previous Dell executives. They have great salaries and great jobs. I had the pleasure to interview one of the two, and he told me the story of why he launched this. And he told me, well, the thrill of going from being an employee to being an entrepreneur, it's something that is unprecedented, but... Why I wanted to do this is because I wanted to reform an industry that was outdated and very inefficient, the food industry. Their dream was to allow any Chinese from anywhere in China to buy food from all over the world in their apartment, from their apartment. They were crazy enough to go after the food industry and reform it. When they launched the business, it was 2008, the financial community disappeared. It was the peak of the financial crisis. They could not raise funds. They almost didn't make it until they made it and they sold to Walmart. How did they do it? They didn't, send, they didn't just copy a model. They reformed an entire industry. They were crazy enough to try to do something that nobody else wanted to do. Let me give you another example. I don't know how many of you know Thibaut Villet, who is the CEO of Glamour Sales. Thibaut Villet's dream was to allow any, oh, first of all, Glamour Sales is the biggest luxury online store in China. His dream was to allow any Chinese from anywhere in China, I'm sorry, to buy luxury goods at the best price. He put himself against competition like the big brands and the big retailers with deep, deep pockets. Yet he was crazy enough to reform an industry. In July 2015, he received a $100 million investment from Alibaba, which made him one of the few foreigners who was successful online in China. So I'm going to conclude, sorry. Um, what have I learned from them? What do they have in common? Well, first of all, if you want to launch a startup in China, if you're crazy enough to launch a startup in China, an online startup in China, well, first of all, you have to understand that you have to build something that is meaningful, that is going to help to change the economy for the better. It's going to be crazy, but you're going to be part of one of the biggest technological revolutions of the world and in history. And whether you want to launch a startup or you're just looking for innovative business model, one thing is becoming certain. China is now the place where innovation is happening on the biggest scale throughout the world. 
In Silicon Valley, they talk about something called the singularity. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term. It's a period of time in the future where technology will change the life of every human being in a way that is irreversible. No one in Silicon Valley talks about where this happened. Maybe they imply that this is going to happen in Silicon Valley. But the truth is that China is on the way to the singularity. Now, when this is going to happen, that is something that I don't know. But one thing is for sure. A country that before was based on a typical industrial model has now renewed itself through a technological revolution. And very soon, it will be ahead of the rest of the world. So when next time somebody asks, what is China exporting? The answer is some of the most innovative business model. The world should notice that times have changed. And if you want to learn about innovation, China is the place where everybody should now look at. Thank you.